Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, kingdom now and forever. Now and forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit 
that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers, which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry, they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. Just as the body is one and has many members, and all members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I would not, do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, but that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? Would that not make it any less part of the body if the whole body were an eye? Where would the sense of smell be? But it is. God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. As all, if all were a single member, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with great respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God so arranged the body giving the greater honor to the inferior member that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but strive for greater gifts. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and open the ears of our heart to hear the word that you have for each one of us to hear. Amen. Amen. If you were at church last week, you might be having, as Yogi Berra said, deja vu all over again. <laughs> we read this passage last week. It was our second re reading, although I didn't speak to it. I chose it, uh, and I chose to read it again and actually speak to it this week because it is so applicable for the Sunday of our annual meeting. This is a letter that Paul wrote while he was in Ephesus. 
in Turkey to the church in Corinth, which is in modern day Greece. Now, most people, and when I say most people, uh, I'm, I'm not speaking just about Christians, but most people in general are familiar with at least part of this letter that Paul wrote. The part that says love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an, an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. But love never ends. So that you all probably recognize, I'm sure, from you know weddings or from the movies. Um, that is a probably one of the most common passages used for weddings and it's so beautiful and it, you see it on note cards and you know in signs and posters when you go into people's homes. Now scholars think that this letter was written by Paul in the 50s. So in the very early earliest stages of the church um, it was written before all four gospels and it was written to this nascent church that had already fallen into trouble. And Paul writes to them back in chapter three, uh, but it's really not chapter three because this really was a letter he wrote out to the church, but he tells them, don't ever forget that the foundation of your church, the foundation, the cornerstone is built on Jesus not on you, not on personalities, but on Jesus. And then he exhorts them to bring their gifts to that community, to that body of Christ. And to me, this is another beautiful part of the passage of the letter, uh, just like that beautiful part that people read in weddings. And he talks about how we're all part of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is the church and how we're individually members of it. But we need each other to make up this body. And he says that God has appointed in the church apostles and prophets and teachers and deeds of power and gifts of healing and forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. And then he, he asks these rhetorical questions. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. We need each other. We need each other to bring all of these things to the table, to bring our gifts. Now, some of you... Uh, you know, I suspect have close to all the gifts. I mean, I look at all the hats that, uh, that Angela wears or Ruth Ann. Uh, we all have many gifts, some gifts, but they're all needed to make up the body of Christ and to make up the church. And we all are endowed with special gifts that are unique to us. Sometimes, you know, I wonder, you know, like, what, what is my gift? What is my gift to bring to the table? And some of you might wonder, like, do I have something to offer? And I recall hearing once this adage, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And that is true. God will equip us. And God will equip us if we listen deeply and if we follow 
where the spirit is leading. God is always calling us to something new, to do new things. If you look at the cover, maybe Lauren can bring up the cover. I put an image of the church in Corinth. And there she goes. Uh, yeah, and you know, those are ruins. Those, those are the ruins of the church planted by Paul himself. And yet the church continues and here we are. They could have never dreamed back then that we would have a church here in Portola Valley. The church is always reinventing itself and being called to do something new. Um, there is a scholar from Princeton who recently died named Phyllis Tickle who talked about the great emergence. And her thesis was that God and the spiritual world and the Holy Spirit is always recreating. And it almost happens cyclically in like 500 year increments. So if you go back to um, 500 BC, that was around the time that the second temple was being rebuilt after when they returned. And then you have Jesus entering and breaking into our world. And then 500 years after that, you have uh, Muhammad and God being seen through a Muslim lens and that rising. And then around 10, I think it's 1054, 1055, we had the Great Schism where East and West Orthodox Church split. And they go in two different directions and do two different uh, things. Always something new. And then 500 years after that, in the 1500s, we had the Great Reformation. And so Phyllis Tickle said, we're due for this new, um, for something new right now at the, in this new millennium. And I think we can see that happening. And I think that out of the ashes of the pandemic, um, I think that for our denomination in particular, uh, it's opened us up to be open to new possibilities and to new things and to envision the church new. So struggle in the church has always been there. St. Francis felt called to give up uh, his posh life to help rebuild the church because he saw so many churches in rubble back then and he lived in the 1500s. So the church is always doing something new. The possibilities are endless. And that's what I love about this letter from Paul to the church in Corinth, because I can't imagine what, what they would have thought looking into the future to know that 2000 years later, we'd be reading that same letter and that we would still be following the example of Christ and still be following the spirit. So as we continue today and in the coming year, my challenge to you is to consider and ponder what gift you have to bring to the body individually and what do we have as a church to bring to our community collectively? Um, I think the possibilities are endless and exciting. And I pray um, that we have the courage and the ability to listen deeply and to move forward enthusiastically. And this will only be possible with the Holy Spirit. So we pray for this in the coming year, for new things, new possibilities, um, in all of God's most beautiful, holy, and sacred names. Amen.
The Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people. With all our heart and mind, let us offer to God our prayers, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For those who feed the believing community throughout the world, especially our presiding Bishop Michael, our Bishop Mark, and our priest Beth, that they might lead us on the path of faithful discipleship. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord in your in mercy, mercy hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For leaders of nations, for those who serve us in government, for reconciliation among nations, races, creeds, and all that can divide us. For the gifts of unity, peace, and grace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord in your mercy, hear our prayer. our prayer. For the consolation and support of all who are in prison, physically, spiritually, and emotionally, especially for Louise Delafield, Bill Aragon, and those we name now, either silently or aloud, but let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord in your mercy, mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For the dead and the bereaved and those who minister them, including Bill and Ida Mark, Tim Adams, and Joe Pickard, and those we now name, either silently or loud. Sally. John Oda Burns. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord in your mercy, mercy hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Our prayer. <clears throat> For the concerns on our hearts today, we pray either silently or loud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord in your mercy, hear our, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Holy God, lover of the human family, help all, helper of all in need. Hear the prayers we offer in faith and strengthen us in your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. In the midst of new life, we confess, we have resisted the light of your love, we have not fully shared the gifts entrusted to us, and we have not treasured the gifts of others around us. We stand in need of your love. Holy Father, make us holy. Holy Jesus, make us holy. Holy Spirit, make us holy. 
Holy God, make us whole. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. 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 The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also, also with, you. with you. Peace, everyone. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our, our Father, Father, who art, who art in heaven, in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will, will be done, be done. On, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. In heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, bread. And, bread. and forgive, and forgive us, our us our trespasses. trespasses. As, As we, we forgive, forgive those, those who trespass against us, and lead us, and lead us not, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For, for thine is the kingdom, the, kingdom, the, the power, power, and the glory, the glory forever, forever and ever. ever. Amen. Amen. A blessing of change. What we choose changes us. Who we love transforms us. How we create remakes us. Where we live reshapes us. So in all our, so in all our choosing, O oh God, make us wise. In all our loving, O oh Christ, make us bold. In all our creating, O oh Spirit, give us courage. In all our living, may we become whole. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and those you love and those for whom you pray this day and evermore. Amen. 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 Ah, well, I don't know if it feels better to be back online or, uh, <laughs> or what, but um, we have some important things. So... Uh, should we're going to move quickly into our um, annual meeting and let me should I pull that up uh, let me ask Lauren is it better if I share it or if you uh, I do have it ready to share if you have it ready to have it up <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> Let me try and see if I can do this. Okay. Um, Cause I, we might need to enlarge some. So. I can see it. Very right, good. Yeah. Um, can I try to. That's okay. That's yeah. fine. Just leave it there. Right, right. Yeah? Yeah. Well, that yeah. works for y'all? All right. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So what you're going to see on the screen today is kind of just highlights uh, without all of the text. I didn't edit it as much as I did last year. Um, it was just, I, I don't know why it was just harder, but all of the full reports are contained online that you can download or look at online on our website. Um, so this, like I said, is a pared down thing. And here, I just wanna give everyone a thank you who's pledged so far. And if you don't see your name on the list, then please give us a shout out if we missed you or skipped you somehow. But these are, the pledges that we have collected to date. And thanks to Angela, we have our own QR code so that you can even make payments online. So I put that there. Mm -hmm. And here's our agenda. And our first order of business is to appoint a clerk. And I believe that Nicole has joined us. Are you there, Nicole? Okay. 
don't hear her, but maybe because she's on mute. Let's see, I did see her. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> All right. So Nicole will um, Nicole will do the note taking for us. And would it be helpful if we put in the chat the agenda? Can we do that, Angela? If, let me see if I can do that. Or um, I can do it. I'll do it. Okay. Great. So let me just begin oh, with wait the invocation. A it's hard to catch it. I got it. I think I got it. Can you do a screenshot? I'm doing it a different way. I'm getting the text, I think. Okay. Oh, I, well, it's going to Beth. Wait a minute, it's got to go to everyone. Okay, while Angela is doing that, I will start with the invocation. It's in the chat. In the, chat. Okay. the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Come God Almighty, creator, redeemer, and giver of life. You have called us at Christ Church to be the bearers of good news. Send your spirit to lead us as we gather to dream, design, and co-create with you a bold future. Open our eyes to the opportunities you give us. Open our ears to hear your call. Open our minds to the wisdom of every voice among us. Open our hearts to your love that we may share it and shine your light on all around us. Guide us to perceive what is right Grant us the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it. Amen. Amen. So here were our minutes from last year. And uh, I don't know if anybody has any um, corrections or amendments. If not, we can take a motion to accept them. I move to accept them. Great. So Mary Hefty moves to accept them. Is there a second? I second. Lauren seconds. Great. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Raise Aye. their hand or in the, I think we're good. All right. Motion passes. So I want to move on to Thanksgivings. Um, I, I left in here a little bit about the what the vestry does. Uh, we have Lori Palazzolo, the Palazzolo family, the eight o'clockers will know them well because they had JJ and Juliana um, who acolyted for us at eight o'clock, but they have moved to Southern California. So mm -hmm. JJ can really pursue um, his mm -hmm. talent and gift for water polo and hopes to be in the Olympics. So that's why Lori departed departs early before her 10 years up. And James is rotating off as is Angela and Terry. And um, you can see uh, Angela does so much. She's a junior warden and clerk. So that's gonna leave a big hole. Our current vestry members are Mary Hefty, Vinny and Ann Vanderstay. And we have oncoming new vestry members and treasurer. We have Betsy Alexander and Ross Subaru and Bob Rucky. And there are bios for them in the actual written report. Um, Bob's been in the front row helping us with tech and Ross, we're delighted to have him join us. He's a general contractor and has been in the building trades his entire adult life. And Yes, he's the father of Dwayne, our interim music person. 
And Betsy has been mm-hmm. treasurer of many nonprofit organizations through the year. Um, so I give Thanksgiving for all of this leadership. And then we have delegates to our general convention and our departing delegates are Carl and Sherry Lund. Continuing on will be Kathy and Stu Langs and Louise Delafield. And James is coming on as an alternate. Um, they, they did a lot of work this year. Carl uh, spearheaded revising um, the bylaws for them and we'll get, more, we'll get to more of that later. And Sherry Lund was nominated or elected last year to the executive council. And that is the board of directors for the entire diocese. And this year she has been elected by her peers to be the vice chair, which means that she will become the chair of the board of directors for the entire diocese next year. And we're really blessed to have that. So what I'd like to do is um, just pray for them. Mm -hmm. For those of you rotating out of leadership positions, let us pray. Almighty God, look with favor upon these persons who have faithfully served in the leadership of this community of faith. We give thanks for their service and ask that you bless and guide them in their continued witness to your almighty love. Amen. 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 Beth, can I just say one thing? I think we ought to say our, our outgoing treasurer in the annual report and thank uh, um, oh, yeah. Marie. Thanks, Anne Marie. Thanks to Anne Marie. For 25 years of service. Huh. So thank you for that. And we'll add that in there. For those of you continuing and entering into leadership positions in the name of this congregation, I commission you for this work and pledge you our prayers, encouragement and support. May the Holy Spirit guide and strengthen you that in this and in all things, you may do God's will in the service of the kingdom of Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, look with your favor upon these persons who have now reaffirmed their commitment to follow Christ and to serve in your name. Give them courage, patience, and vision, and strengthen us all in your Christian vocation of witness to the world and of service to others through your most beautiful, holy, and sacred names we pray. Amen. 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 So we had uh, four different groups for adult formation this year. This was our first year collaborating with Transfiguration in San Mateo for the El Dia de los Muertos um, celebration, or what we know as Day of the Dead. And that was a first for us collaborating with that church and first for us celebrating this tradition to my knowledge. And it consisted of four hour sessions on Zoom where Joseph Villa really explained it and brought, uh, brought it to life for us and, ex- and helped us celebrate those who have gone before us and honor them. Um, and because of COVID, we started doing a quick morning prayer, not the morning prayer that we traditionally had in the Book of Common Prayer that many of you might be familiar with, but a new book has come out called Daily Prayer for All Seasons. And so it's a quick 10-minute service that has a little bit of scripture, some prayer, and meditations from all sorts of different people not just Episcopalians. And we meet on Zoom on weekday mornings at 9 a.m. And we've had as many as 16 people join us and as far away as Japan. 
And then we also offered Sacred Ground, which was a film-based dialogue on, on race and faith. And we collaborated on that with uh, the church in Redwood City and with the Church of the Epiphany. And then at the very end, some people joined us from Trinity Menlo. Um, so that's been uh, really that's still going on. amazing. That's yeah. Still going on. Uh, one of the, yeah, so we, we actually had two groups and I think one has finished and one's still continuing. We, so between the three churches that initially started, we had two groups. And then our women's spirituality group continues being led by Mary Jennings. And that is at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays. Buildings and grounds. Just to give you an update, uh, thank, we thank Paul for leading that team and we continue to give thanks to Ruth Ann and Bob mm -hmm. for all they do in the garden and to Jim Sedgwick as he continues to lend us uh, his service of his uh, construction company. We had the parish hall and the classrooms repainted he completely renovated Nicole, the admin's office, and it looks beautiful. And he replaced and shored up our wooden fence. So he did a lot of work. Um, and Angela Hay and Ross Subaru managed after many years to find an inexpensive and effective solution to our slippery concrete. And I could not be more grateful for that. And as most of you know, the biggest project uh, that we began in 2020 with the lovely large kickoff fundraising gift from the Kingston Flum family was the completion of the refurbishment of the Carillon Tower. So I think Paul's on here, uh, but Paul, the, I put his entire report into our full, um, into our full annual report, but here it is as it stands today, but he included <clears throat> these. You want me to say something about it, Ben? Yeah, just if you can walk us through this. Sure. sure. So um, you could scroll up a little, I put in some of the historical pictures I thought was cool. So right there is the, um, the work when they put up the tower, the wooden tower, the original tower. It was, uh, we don't know exactly the displacement date, but they were still paving the parking lot when the tower was up. And you see a picture of the wooden tower, and just above that, you can see where they were actually hoisting it up with the crane. It was in pieces, and the bells were already installed on it, and they hoisted up the pieces. And then if you scroll down. Hang on, Paul. Day, Paul. Yeah, Yes. I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you for a minute and ask everyone to put themselves on mute because there's a lot of feedback. And then Can everyone put themselves on mute? I don't know. We hear some kids for sure. Yeah. Um, Beth, it may be the Zoom user that's trying to connect. I'm watching it, too. It could be it could grandmas, be, you know. <laughs> it could be Suzanne Redfern Rest. Oh, okay. Um, all right, it's gone. All right, Paul. So I see the parking lot. Oh, Paul, we can't hear you at all. I'm on Can't you hear me? Yeah, it sounds like you're on Mars. Sorry. <laughs> Very far away. Oh, well, you could watch through it. It's not to say the okay. is the pictures of the steel going up and then the new, the new installation. So take it from there. Yeah, I think it's actually Paul's connection that 
we're getting all that from. <clears throat> so here are pictures Paul had in his archives of the actual wooden original tower. <clears throat> and we don't know the date it was put up, but as he was able to logically deduce <clears throat> right here, um, you can see the old wooden tower and that was put in before the parking lot was paved and that was paved in 57. So there's a picture of the old wooden one. And then as a result of that Vision 87 uh, can capital campaign, they replaced it with a metal, the metal carillon. And that's it being raised right there. But over time, issues developed. Uh, you know, it's fairly old. And let's see, Paul, can you mute yourself? Oh, he is. All right, maybe it's. Oh, I'm where we are. Yeah. Okay. Is still bad? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, if you can hear me, that's the tower went up on the same day as the Loma Prieta earthquake, and they got it up in place, attacked it down an hour before the earthquake hit. Really and then we replaced the controller with a, a thing that was the size of a refrigerator, is now a thing about the size of a radio. And the six giant controller boxes, which were in the back of the, of the office um, by the fireplace, got replaced with two nice small compact controllers to run the 34 bells. And we refurbished 30, so 17 of the 34 bells got refurbished. I think they reported that we only had two bird nests, which was considered a low number uh, for pulling bird nests out of bells. So we got all their bells back and they worked from morning to now with the switch, with the stop and play the bells at any concert. And we have music <laughs> in our library which will pay the bells by music and of course the Westminster and all the service. And a couple of pictures showing what it looks like if you're a bird up in the tower with the gap. So that's it. Uh, we're happy to report it's all working and everybody seems to be delighted. That's wonderful. Thank you. So moving on to Caroline, Kara and Christine Williams continue as our co-directors and uh, they've survived many challenges Caroline School has. When I first came, <clears throat> when I arrived uh, in 2015, the vestry, <clears throat> they had to start from scratch. Uh, they had no teachers and no director. Um, so Nancy Kruber came in as the temporary and we tried to start rebuilding it in 2015 from scratch. <clears throat> Unbeknownst to us at the time, we didn't know when Mill would be building that new shiny place across the street, but they managed to survive that. And then we had COVID hit um, and with substantial assistance from, from the church, they've survived COVID. And now the next challenge is a new California law implementing universal health care. So that will um, definitely impact us in our future. As far as children and youth ministries go, we have I think the biggest class we've ever had of confirmation kids, and we have seven, and we have nursery, although at the moment it is temporarily suspended because our priory uh, nursery caregivers are in lockdown. Um, and we have very few people between five and 12. We brought in Valerie Wookie to work with us and be our youth and children ministries coordinator but uh, she presented us with the hard truth. There isn't really much to coordinate. Uh, the families of the kids from between five and 12 
suggested that we just do Sunday school once a month to get a critical mass, so that's what we do. As far as church funerals, churchyard and funerals go, Paul and Linda Millard continue to be trustees, and there's the balance for that. In this past year, we lost John Gardner and Howard Middleton. Um, so that was in 2021, although we did have finally a service for Peter Llewellyn, even though he died the year before in 2020, but it was postponed in hopes that more people would be able to attend a year later because of the pandemic. And that actually turned out be, to be the case because then we had vaccines. And we did a funeral for Father John's best, one of his best friends also in December. Beth, before you leave that page, could you tell people what the impact of universal health care would be? You just said there was a challenge. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, and that's wrong. It shouldn't be health care. It should be universal preschool. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which is Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's been very challenging, the, the preschool, and to no fault of theirs. Like I said, um, you know, we had windmill building across the street, and then we had COVID, and now we have this new universal law that is providing pre free preschool uh, for everyone. It's a mandate, and Ormondale will be offering it. So that means that everybody in that upper class of ours, which we call ladybugs, can now have free preschool. And that is really where we have been able to uh, not make money, but to that's uh, where we do make most of the money for the preschool to support it and sustain it. And so we anticipate that we will continue to have some people who are gonna continue forward with us, but in this coming year, I'll probably, they were very conservative in their estimates, but they'll lose half that class. Um, and the year after that, is even more precarious. So this is a huge challenge and it's not anything that we could have foreseen. Um, it just seems like we can't get a break there, but thank you for asking that. And we'll look at more when we get to the budget and it will be really clear how much that's going to impact the preschool. Uh, we've had the deanery and diocesan convention report um, like I said, Carl led a committee of clergy and lay leaders and redoing the bylaws. And then all of those delegates go to convention and we pass some fairly important resolutions. Uh, one being carbon sequestration and another on racial justice and reconciliation um, to try to put some legislation in place for that. that uh, goes from um, fighting voter suppression, calling for stronger hate crime legislation, and then within our own church, making Juneteenth a feast day. So there's a lot of important work that was done at the convention level by the delegates. And let me just say, anybody would be interested in being a delegate. Uh, let me know. This isn't um, a private or exclusive club, neither is the vestry. So if you have interest in offering your gifts to this type of work and leadership in the larger church or in our church, uh, we would welcome you. Uh, Sherry, uh, like I said, is next you're gonna be head of the board of directors for the entire diocese. And they have been very, very busy. She actually had her reports really long, but um, she, I just picked out some highlights about their shift to in the diocese to be more service oriented to the parishes to help sustain and support us more be in different ways. And 
um, they're going to start this new program called Vital and Thriving because most of our parishes are shrinking and uh, they've identified already 10 parishes in peril, which means that they are going to run out of funds and very quickly. So they're going to be part of this new process called Vital and Thriving, where they will get together starting in the fall and discern their future together. And as uh, I thought that Sherry so well put it, uh, intentional in choosing and planning for a path of vitality or choosing a path of parish hospice that involves winding down. Uh, and I hear that there are 10 more churches lined up before, behind them. So that's something that the diocese is working on. And then the Bluebird Project is an initiative that uh, is underway of a big piece of property that the diocese owns. And let's see, Sherry's also on the task force on leadership um, that was created this fall. That's lay and clergy members, and they're working on methodologies for recruiting strong diocesan leadership. So there's a lot more in her report, but she's doing amazing and good work uh, at the diocesan level. Uh, Angela Hay, do you wanna say, highlight that? Uh, she has sure, I can, I, I can read. Um, I was leading the regathering team and I would like to thank all the people, uh, Penny and Danny Allegria and uh, Lauren in particular. Um, and is Lauren's name spelt properly there? It doesn't look, it looks like WIC team, but anyway, um, maybe it's just the fuzziness on my screen. Um, and so, yes, and I'd, I'd like to thank all the people who helped with setting up our patio services and uh, Bob Rookie for managing the Zoom inside the church faithfully every week when we've been inside the church. And also um, Paul Lavoie denoted some, donated some components for Google um, Wi-Fi network, which means we can now get higher speed Wi-Fi in the sanctuary. And uh, you've seen the QR code already and we've been doing Zoom. So uh, also job. as junior warden, we've had the, the buildings and grounds and so forth. So any questions on that? Thank you. And uh, Lauren, Lauren, do you wanna give us a few highlights? Sure, yeah. Um, so uh, the main highlight of last year was returning to in-person choir, I, I think. Um, and uh, we were able to do that you know, safely. And um, it was so nice to be together as our, you know, singing community. Again, it's a big difference between the, the level of community when you're, you know, just sending in your video or when you're actually singing together in person. So that was our joy of uh, 2021. And we look forward to uh, even more of that going forward. So thank you. Ah. Outreach and mission, unbelievable when you look at our numbers. And uh, I had to put in a picture of Kathy Kennedy because she's always so humble and never toots her own horn, but man, she has led our tiny parish to mighty things. And to think that we've served over 1,540 meals amazing and uh all of the linens that were collected the backpacks uh outerwear toiletries it's just amazing and that's just for one of the charities that's just one of them um and she's gotten so many volunteers to get involved from the young to the old kathy do you want to say anything Sure. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, you all have been amazing. We support four different charities. Um, uh, two of them help deal with the homeless 
issue here in um, locally, Life Moves and Home and Hope. And um, in both cases, our group has had to step up because other groups have backed out out of fear related to COVID. So um, we've been able to make a huge difference in, in, in with both of these groups. We continue to support Gaia, which is actually eradicating AIDS in Malawi um, and is probably within a few years of having accomplished that goal and possibly moving into another co local country in Africa that is in need of similar help. And this year we began working with a group called Spirit Care um, which provides spiritual support for um, institutionalized seniors. And it, that was a group that was particularly hit by COVID, not just because many of them died, um, but because so many of them um, were completely cut off from um, loved ones. And so um, we are starting to figure out how we can best support that group. And uh, we encourage you to come along on one of the Sundays when we visit uh, um, a local memory care unit and sing a song or, or, or just do a reading. Um, or or in, uh, this month, make a Valentine State card. So um, lots of things going on, many ways to um, participate. And we would love to have you involved. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, all right. Let's see. Can you all hear me? Let me pull up. So as far as my rector's report goes, um, I'm going to take my lead from Father John Odebergs. There were many things that I learned from him. And when he did a funeral, he always spoke about the Eucharist and how our service is focused on the Eucharist, which in Greek means Thanksgiving. Our entire service focuses on Thanksgiving and that's what I'm filled with in my heart for all of you guys is true thanksgiving. I give thanksgiving for all of you and all of your gifts. And I first wanna give thanks to Nicole and Lauren who I work with in the parish office. They are both amazing. They do so much behind the scenes work beyond what you would think. And I'm so grateful for them and they're a joy and a blessing to me and to our parish. I give thanks for them. And I give thanks for our vestry who do the hard work um, of running more of the business affairs of the church and the parish and giving sound counsel and help. And I give a special Thanksgiving this year to Angela Hay, who has just been a superstar and wear so many hats. She's been clerk. Uh, James Mack had to step away. He had some health care uh, con concerns with one of his children. So Angela stepped in and became the clerk for the vestry. And then she's also the junior warden. So she coordinates a lot of the stuff happening on the buildings and grounds with Paul. And then she, spearheaded our regathering team with COVID and that has been critical and she's done an amazing job that I am to I don't even want to say this out loud but I don't think we've had a single COVID infection happen at church now that I say that it will probably happen this week but I think that's amazing and our team She's led an amazing team to keep us all safe, not just the church, but also the preschool. And then in addition to all that, she's made this technology happen for us. So God bless you, Angela, and thank you. And we have a special gift card for you for Denny's.
That is fantastic. That is our Thanksgiving tradition, if anyone doesn't know, that we go to Denny's. But I'd like to share something with you. Um, and I think this is a picture for the future. I was on a Zoom thing where we had to paint a picture. And these are multiple hands um, holding the torch and the flame for the future. We had to paint it on Zoom for the San Francisco Foundation. I think that's what we're doing. We're holding hands together based on our sermon that we're all part of the body. Um, some are feet as well and some are brains. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Um, thank, thank you, you very you. much. That's a huge surprise. <laughs> well, um, so, uh, yeah, that's one of the more endearing facts about you, Angelus, that they go to a different Denny's every Thanksgiving. Um, and I, I find that charming. So I thought you guys would appreciate that. And I want it, to well, it'll give us a chance to get out of Portola Valley. <laughs> let me tell you. Thank you. Parkside Grill is getting old. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so just uh, uh, an amazing amount of work, an amazing amount of work by our treasurer and we're Anne Marie, who has done it for so many years and who has begged for relief for so many years. And we're grateful that. Uh, Betsy Alexander is going to uh, handle that and she has a lot of experience doing it so we're excited about that. My highlights, there's so much highlight but I think in for me for the past year our outreach has been amazing um, and inspiring that such a small church can do so much and thank you Kathy for that. Our even song service that Lauren put together and led fed my soul, and that was a highlight. Getting the Carillon bells refurbished after them not working properly for so long was amazing, and I give thanks to everyone who contributed to that and to Paul for spearheading that. And you'll see later the stewardship team led by Wendy and Trisha Christensen has been phenomenal. And that has made my life so much easier. And that has been a blessing. And another highlight for me in the past year has been some of the intimacy that I think that we gained through being on Zoom. And if you go back and think about it, I remember the first couple times that we were on Zoom and it was the first time I was ever in many of your homes. And it was wonderful to see Louise's cat walk through the background and to see the Flum, Flum family sitting on their couch and what that looks like. And then all of the wonderful things that our fellowship team did for us um, and put together for us. That was really fun. The Zoom things that they did. Um, you know, we had the bingo, we had uh, trivia night, and it just gave us an opportunity to share. I love that. Our challenges this past year have been the fire in the sanctuary. And, you know, we've had technology challenges as I think be really became more aware of uh, with the funeral of John Oda Burns and stuff that Bob and Angela have done an amazing job getting us online, but when we're in the church, you know, we have a problem with being heard in the audio. So we have an angel donor that is going to help us upgrade so that we'll have better audio in the future. So that's exciting. And I look forward to that. I look forward to, in this coming year, confirmation of our seven Confirmance, and I hope that we can have it in person at Grace Cathedral. And I look forward to being in person for fellowship. You know, that part of being the body of Christ and part of Jesus is being incarnate, being in person. And I can't wait until we can gather and break bread together in our parish hall. And then finally, just so you know what's coming up is, I am two years overdue for a sabbatical. Um, and that has 
poor self-care, poor example to the staff and to you all, but I will be taking that in September, um, after, right after we uh, come back together for the program year, I will be taking a sabbatical. And you might wanna know what I'm doing. Well, we don't know at this point. We had two desires. One was to go visit Bertha and spend time with her and see how we might collaborate with her in the future in building the church there. But at this point in time with the pandemic, it may not be the best time to go to Africa. And our other uh, desire was to go do um, some classes at Yale, both Charlie and I, they allow spouses to do that as well in their alumni program and just get refed intellectually and spiritually there. Uh, but because of the pandemic, that's suspended. So I'll keep you posted. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Terry Lynn, our senior warden. Oh. Actually, can I interrupt just briefly? Yeah. I wanted to thank um, folks who had been on the fellowship team, um, Lenora yes. Lavoy, Carol Wentworth, uh, my husband, Carl Cheney. And then there were a number of people who helped us with things like Zoom trivia night, um, questions oh, yeah. that were Andy designed Flaum. by Andy Flaum and um, awesome job of uh, being the cool host and game master of all time, Jeffrey Rainey from Minnesota. Um, and then, um, the Zoom Get to Know You Bingo, which Carl designed. And uh, I'm still working off the book movie streaming game sharing, um, which was so fantastic. Even if we get together again, I want to do that again. So thank you all so much for your help with that. Uh, yeah, you guys were amazing. And that, that was really a wonderful way for us to connect. So thank you. And I've got a great picture, I think, of Jeffrey in the bigger annual report uh, of helping. But thank you all for doing that and getting us through and keeping us connected. All right. Can you hear me, Beth? Yeah. yeah. Great. Let me know when you want me to set up. Yeah, we're ready. So uh, I think the highlight here is the church is actually stable thanks to uh, really the amazing stewardship team. Um, the number of pledges uh, increased from last year. Um, the amount we collected was also slightly higher. Uh, a few people were unable to meet their pledge. That's okay, life happens. Um, there were a few extra gifts that we didn't include in the total amount collected. Probably could have been included, but they were special gifts. Um, so just to reiterate, the stewardship team did a great job. Um, attendance is down as you can see uh, from some of this. However, if you benchmark us against the kind of standard of what everyone else is doing, um, most of the churches are reporting slightly less than half the attendance compared to pre-pandemic numbers. Um, we're a little bit better than that. Um, I think the other key thing here from a budget perspective is we've managed to keep our expenses down. Most of our costs are fairly fixed. Um, of course, I'll just because I have everyone on the horn to say, um, if you haven't pledged, please do. Um, do you Going want me into to move the, to the church budget? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, and the, uh, the point that I would highlight here is really um, just a couple of things. If you look at our top line, we're down slightly um, to be expected. We do have some infill that happens for, through the year, but we want to be conservative. So right now we've got 350000 is the top line for revenue. Um, when you Jerry, come through- Jerry, Jerry yes. before you go on longer, and Beth, um, these numbers are unreadable on my screen. Okay. They're unreadable in make small them. form. And when I make them bigger, they're okay. Now it's getting a little clearer. I was going to say when I made them bigger, they were equally blurry, but okay. Now the other option you have as well is, um, well, actually, I'm not sure. Do we have the annual report up on the website, Mother Beth? Yeah, we do. So that might be another option if people wanted to pull the PDF down. Okay. Yeah. But I can make it in. bigger here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you see the 351. Um, what you'll note is you you know, kind of zoom down through is we lost about $18,000 last year. And uh, we're planning, again, we're being conservative by um, kind of making the revenue line light, but then also kind of uh, making the expense line heavy, if you will. So conservative on both ends. So we're showing that the loss increases slightly to by approximately, you know, 20 something thousand dollars. Um, 
gets a little bit worse. Um, that is what it is. Uh, most of the items here are relatively flat or better. So this is really, um, I think, just a reflection of attendance. Um, just on the balance sheet, one of the things I just note here is uh, we're looking at about $2 million in total checkings and savings, which is great. I think when I first was on the vestry years ago, prior to Mother Beth getting here, I think we were down around a million dollars. Yeah. So um, this is a pretty healthy balance sheet um, for our organization to have. Um, just want to point that out. The only other kind of swing that happened here is if you recall the PPP numbers where we got about $100,000 for the loan from the government, it was then forgiven. That's now swung to an asset, um, or, or I should say that that's, uh, that's gone. So, um, so I, I think we unwound all the paperwork associated with that. So that certainly helped. Um, let me, can you zoom forward to the uh, Carillon budget? So that kind of just lets up, hang on, oh, sure. I'm getting there. Yeah, if there's any questions, we can go through any of that. But I mean, most of this stuff's pretty straightforward. I'm just hitting the highlights and assume that people will come back with questions later once they come and scrutinize this stuff if they want to. So uh, yeah, just make sure you pick up the left axis there. I think the, uh, you know, picking up the point you made earlier, Beth, about the preschool, you know, we're budgeting for this upcoming school year and it's a little bit different because it's the school year that bridges years but we did $315,000 of revenue in the preschool last year. And we're actually looking at about 250,000 this year. And again, I agree, the team's doing a great job. We are having some strategic headwinds, if you will, by this universal pre-K. So that really takes out one of our most profitable classes. So I think you see that reflected in the revenue numbers here. Um, so it's a little challenged. The, uh, the only other kind of story in here is we do have some uh, healthcare expenses that went up. Um, that is, we've got a couple more people on healthcare benefits. It is what it is. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of, uh, ability to move that number. So if you look, um, we lost about $21,000 on the, uh, last year, and it's looking like we're going to be down around 90,000. So that's a 70,000 worse, which is almost entirely the revenue shortfall. Um, I think, uh, just looking at this and in, in zooming back from the details and the spreadsheets, there's a couple of things that come to mind. So one is part of the reason we can be this healthy financially as a church and as a preschool is because we own the grounds, because we have that as an asset and it's not included in that $2 million numbers. Um, if we were renting the space, um, we would be hemorrhaging money, frankly. One of the other things to point out here is whenever we've had these shortfalls, um, you know, just an observation, it's interesting in that the amount we pay for housing subsidies for the rector is about that amount. So just a strategic thought, and I just want to kind of plant the bug in the head, and it riffs off some things we've said in prior years, which is if we were able to shift that into more of a fixed asset, for example, if we had housing uh, on campus and leverage that asset, um, we're fine right now with Mother Beth, uh, you know, she's in a house, everything's set. But if in the future we ever needed a new rector, uh, just consider that it would be very difficult without a pretty large. Hey, Anna, I'm on the phone. Okay, sorry. This is Anna. She needed a hug. Hello, hello, Anna Badana. I'm talking to a bunch of people. Okay. So, okay, let me finish. So, uh, just. Yeah. When you finish, um, I, we had a raised hand by Carl, but oh, sure. go ahead. Uh, go ahead if you want to wrap up oh, that no, thought uh, about Jerry, it. Jerry, please go ahead and finish. I, I can wait until you finish. Yeah, so, so the main point there is if we were able to have um, a rectory, if you will, or uh, yeah, basically um, to shift some of the cost of housing into uh, more just on campus and it was there, I think in the future, and I'm planning ahead, you know, think, you know, five plus years out, but I think that would be a tremendous asset for um, if in the future we were going down the path of getting a new rector. So um, anyway, uh, again, I'm just trying to be strategic and think out in those years, but you can see the benefit of having, um, having the grounds already paid for. So I was just basically thinking, how do we shift some more into having paid for items? So um, that's kind of it for me on the overview. So. Questions up, you said? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm 
concerned about the uh, possible uh, huge deficit by the uh, preschool. Uh, and then in our minutes, we approved a set of um, uh, uh, so the treasurer's uh, perspective said that we might, that the preschool uh, might make as much as $30,000 uh, surplus. And yet uh, what uh, came in was a $21,000 deficit. So a swing of $50,000 right there. Um, and so I'm looking at that uh, possible deficit of $90,000 uh, and that could swing maybe $50,000 lower or $50,000 higher. Um, so the nut of my question, Terry, is um, what, what, what is the possible, if, if indeed the uh, school uh, ran a deficit of $90,000, what would be the impact on our uh, end of year budget in terms of actuals next year? Would it exceed uh, what we have? Uh, would we swing from you know, this short, shortfall that we're projecting right now, which is relatively small, uh, to a quite major shortfall? Um, you know, kind of what's the relationship between the expenses that we see and this possible $90,000? And likewise, the flip side of that is if we um, reduce the scope of the preschool or didn't continue with it, what would be the impact on our uh, budget? Sure. And uh, Mother Beth, correct me if I make any mistakes here. So these budgets are synchronized. So if you saw a variation happen in the preschool budget, like to your example, if we had a $50,000 swing to the negative, um, then that would show up also in the consolidated church budget. So um, that is real. A lot of the fluctuation here is it can be very difficult to forecast what enrollment is going to look like next year. So there is quite a bit of variability that happens in the, uh, the revenue line. And that's what you're seeing the fluctuation really happen there. Um, I understand your concern. Um, I share the same concerns. When I look strategically at the preschool, um, I think on the qualitative side, the, we have a great team, um, a lot of happy people there. I think at least conceptually, it's a uh, path in for new members into the church. Um, at least conceptually, the, you know, I do look at the hard numbers and this is a, uh, it's a large negative and it could swing even larger. So given that's the case and we're a small congregation, is that the, the way that we as a congregation want to spend our money? Um, I, I think that's a fair question. Um, I, I don't think we can answer that today. Um, Mother Beth is going to talk a little bit about a, a consultant, um, to bring on and uh, to examine some of these questions. I think if we are gonna go down the existential question around the preschool, or um, do we want to make any modifications to it? That's not something we can turn on a dime. I don't think we could just sit there and say, hey, we don't like the numbers, let's send everyone help. Um, this is a large endeavor for the church. If we were to make any transitions there, we would need to wind things down slowly if that were a choice. So um, I, I think that it's, uh, it's a great point you bring up the financial variability that can bleed through to the church. And is it worth the qualitative upsides, um, you know, that are in there. So uh, I, I kind of thank you for bringing up the point. I honor it. I, I don't have concrete answers. I can't give you a solid number that says this is exactly what it is. So did I answer your questions? Yeah, um, we not, have two more. Not, not quite, but I see other people who have questions. I, I, I would, a counter with some additional concerns, uh, but I think I'll leave the floor to these other folks whose hands are up. Uh, Paul, for some reason I see, I don't know whose is up first, Paul's or Sherry's, but either one of you. Hi. Um, so thank you very much for, for the, the work and the report. That's, that's excellent. Uh, you know, it puts it in perspective. I don't want to talk specifically about the numbers, but I know, uh, I was on the vestry when we decided to start the preschool and there was a lot of angst and gnashing of teeth about, well, we were starting something new and, you know, windmill was not where it is now, but it was in the valley and et cetera, et cetera. And I, I just um, pushed really hard that we'd have it because I felt, you know, it was going to make a huge difference. And we got into credentialing and it was the last, day before we opened that we finally got our credential it was all sorts of 
things. And we've, we've had our share of difficulties with the directors and the teachers and, and such. But I think that the church school is probably the one really thing that saves Christ Church. And I think it will continue to save it. And I know it's got some worries about enrollment. That was the worry at the beginning. We always figured that out. And it's always ended up being whole. I think that we're the only Christian preschool in the area. And I think there's still, even if, uh, you know, uh, TK comes in and takes some, there's still going to be plenty of room to fill. And if we change our, uh, our program a little bit to be after TK, before TK, depending on their half day, and if we keep doing what we've done, I think we will enroll, and I think we will fully enroll. We have to advertise might be more, we have to do a little more work, but I think it's so vital to our church survival that that's just how I feel about it, and I'll let it go at that. Thank you, Paul. The, uh, I, I think, um, you know, I, I oftentimes have felt the way you feel. I, I maybe still feel the way I don't know. Um, I, I just think it's, uh, it, it's a large issue and it's something we should, you know, open up for discussion. Um, we're not going to solve it today, but again, it, it's, and I would also put this into the kind of a larger set of strategic questions, which is how do we grow and thrive as a church? You know, is it this, is it this plus other things, um, you know, rather than just saying, okay, let's do status quo. Um, this very well could be a piece of us going forward. Um, and I think by default it is, but are there ways that we can modify this thing and really unlock it? You know, we've got, um, you know, just in society in general, the fact that church attendance is down by half pre-pandemic numbers versus now is a, uh, it's a pretty significant thing. So, um, I, I just think we need to have that discussion and, uh, you know, we're not the Catholic church. Um, so we don't just do what the Pope tells us to do. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy that we're having this discussion. So, um, Sherry, if you have any questions. Um, well, some comments and some questions. Um, I, I think there's some information maybe that's, uh, that hasn't really been raised here yet is that there are in fact, a lot of preschools around here. And now they're going to be competing, not for the, not even for the profitable work in the preschool, but for the, uh, uh, it, it, it basically becomes uh, infant and toddler care. Um, and so the educational component that we've been providing that I think is deeply connected to our mission is just not going to be there. So um, I think, is this the highest and best use of our resources and our assets? Um, and the other thing is that having been now on the diocesan executive uh, council, the board of directors, you know, I see lots of other parishes that have preschools and the ones that are most successful, uh, frankly, are the ones that have, they're separately incorporated. So that uh, we right now are taking on the full risk of the preschool, the profitability, the legal liability, all those kinds of things. Um, I think the only, to me, the only uh, or the best, uh, I shouldn't say the only, but uh, I think the best organizational structure or relationship for us to have with anybody, preschool or anybody else, is more landlord tenant rather than us try and run a business in which we're really not experts and we really don't, uh, you know, anyway, we, we're just not experts in that business. And um, it kind of reminds me of when uh, somebody I knew who worked for Sun Oil said, uh, came into a meeting one day and said, uh, our corporation just bought a donut business. What were they thinking? And, um, you know, I think we need to stick to the kinds of businesses that we know or the kinds of work that we know. So um, I, I also would take, uh, have a different point of view about we have to wind this down really slowly. Um, I was uh, uh, frankly alarmed to see a posting on our listserv locally that said that the preschool was going to be doing uh, open houses, and I presume doing enrollment signups in the next couple of weeks. And I find that very alarming. So if we had pledges of somewhere around $372,000, and we're looking at a $90,000 loss, I mean, I just don't feel like that's responsible. And I don't feel like we're doing the work of Jesus, because we're really not, you know, we're not uh, providing preschool, and we're not even providing preschool anymore. We, now we'd be providing childcare 
for a, a pretty wealthy community. You know, we're not working with the inner city or doing uh, working with East Palo Alto. So I think there are, I mean, I could get very excited about sitting down as a parish and having some creative discussions about other ways in which we can um, attract other people, um, have other people on campus, uh, maybe have some nonprofit businesses located on campus uh, that, again, are separately incorporated um, and really um, expand our mission, expand our profile as a church and uh, and be profitable too. maybe less than we used to be. Um, you know, in the early years, uh, when this was all started many years ago, Mary Fleischman, uh, we were making around sixty thousand dollars a year. And as Carl pointed out, the report we just approved said, well, we might make as, uh, the preschool might make as much as 30,000. In fact, last year, the parish contributed, over, I think at least 30, if not over 30,000. So um, we were in a loss position last year. And to me, the trajectory here is very clear. And I would personally urge, um, I'm not sure how we go about this. I mean, I, if I were making a motion about the budget, I would say, I, I don't think any decision should be, I don't think anybody should be signed up for the preschool in the next two weeks or until we really discern this more clearly. But um, if this were my decision today, I would say this is the best time on earth to end the preschool and, and look at, at something else for our future that has that common mission and um, financial stability and that doesn't put us on the liability hook in the way that we are right now. Um, because teachers and anybody involved would have uh, four months notice before the end of the school year. They'd have seven months notice before the beginning of the next year. But right now, if we go forward the way we are in kind of lockstep without really thinking this through, we're looking at a $90,000 hit to our budget, <clears throat> if not more, if not more. Um, and uh, being locked into contracts for, for the next 16 months. And I, I just don't feel like that's a really responsible uh, direction forward. Sherry, this is Ruth Dam. Yep. I'd like to speak because I was been involved in the preschool as a music teacher to them for a year and a half. So I watched daily how, and I wanna say that preschool is far more than just childcare. There is such an atmosphere of a, of a direction by the teachers of mindfulness, of charity, of being kind to one another. The atmosphere and the interactions of children in this school is far more important than just monetary. And uh, I would say that we can get through this, put our minds to it creatively, but I cannot say get rid of that preschool at this time. I would really fight it. So just to clarify, um, child care is what would be happening going forward. That's not what has been happening. And I, I think the- not child care. This is not just child care at that school. Ruth Ann, it will be after, given the new law, because we won't I, have the upper grades anymore. Uh, Sherry, let me, I want to know, does this mean that a place like Windmill also cannot charge and has yes. to give free school yes. also? That's correct. Can our diocese, can our diocese get be, be more clear on this? Because this is sort of hitting me between the eyes. Well, I'm telling you right now, and actually I had hope, I had actually asked uh, that this information be shared with all of us in advance so we could absorb it more because I think this is big news to land in an annual meeting, but no other preschool will be able to charge for those upper grades. And so all of them will be relegated to pretty much childcare. And it could be that offering some kind of Christian education to younger kids could be done even as a separate, I mean, I could envision that could maybe be a separate thing we could offer um, for all kinds of people in the area. But the way it's set up right now, there, there is, you know, these this, uh, public schools will get all that money that we had gotten before, and we will, in fact, be doing child care. And, and let me just say, this is nothing, I, I don't want to say anything negative about the preschool themselves. I think it's been a wonderful thing over the years. 
Um, I think people are super committed. I think it has done all those things that you've said, Ruth Ann, but the, the, the scenario has changed and it's nobody's fault. It's, it just is what it is. But I think if we don't look it in the face, I, I don't think we're being good stewards of our, you know, our own mission and our finances. Hi, Sherry, just, just to clarify, um, I, I believe the universal pre, it's basically Young Fives program is the only thing that really gets competition from, right? I don't think it's, four, it's taken. Four year old. No, it's three, it's, it's three, three and four and four and five. Got it. Okay. Uh, so so I, it would be. Because I work with Carol on preschool pretty closely. It is for the next four years, it will be the four-year-olds. So we're really only talking about the oldest kids at Carillon. Ormondale Elementary School is only projecting 36 children entering pre-K next year. So we're not talking about taking away all the students at Carillon. We're talking about taking away maybe half of our oldest group. We have three age groups currently. Um, this one, little one is in the middle age group and he will continue to be at Carillon next year. The three and four year olds will still continue to get the Christian education that they're receiving currently and it's still really beneficial to them. It definitely will not be daycare. Our youngest group goes down to two and they still get a lot of really great socialization from that class. Um, I don't know if they get, um, Mother Beth, do you see the two year olds? I don't think you do. No, so only the three and four year olds get it, which is true. We increased our lower grades, they wouldn't be getting the Christian education, but we could also get really creative and look at things like an after school program. Um, like Ormondale's TK ends at 1145. Instead of doing a morning program, we could potentially do an afternoon program. We could also get creative and offer a lot of different programs. And I don't really think we should shut the school down. I think we should like work together and see what we can do to um, offer the Christian education that we do to our community differently. We just have to get creative. I completely support the offering the Christian education to our community differently. I mean, I think that's a great, you know, possibility that I, you know, that I've been kind of advocating as well. Um, I, you know, but you're saying there's really minimal impact on the students and now we're looking at a potential $90,000 loss. So if there was significant impact or more impact than you expect, it could be more. I think that's concerning. So I'll let I see other some hands talk. raised. Um, let me just speak to a couple things. Um, to what Ruth Ann's. Um, so what Ruth Ann said is completely correct that there's so much going on in the school um, and it's not it's not daycare, there's so much more enrichment. On the other hand, um, what Sherry said was correct too, is that we will lose that upper end because of free, we'll lose a lot of a substantial amount uh, who will opt to go for the free uh, universal pre-K. We've seen, that's been our experience in the past, even with parishioners, um, when they, when their kids were able to get into the transitional TK, uh, they opted for that. That's been our past experience. Um, and so one of the ideas is to, th this is really the first year we've had a two-year-old class and that is a very young class and the teachers did not feel like they were developmentally appropriate for, to the point for chapel. Um, and so that two-year-old class is their socialization aspects to it, yes, but it is more, it, it's not any different from what would be in a daycare. So there are a variety of different ways. We won't solve that today of uh, looking at going forward. Um, but when it was originally founded, um, it was, we had a huge, we had a huge Sunday school program that fed it. And we had somebody that bridged the church and the preschool. And so there was a lot of fluidity, but we were the feeder to the preschool. And then at some point in time, we hoped 
that the preschool would be a feeder to the church. Um, and it may be, you know, right now, the way it's structured, we have two part-time directors getting full-time benefits. And that's really probably not a sustainable model for one thing. Um, we could scale down to a smaller boutique thing. Um, and like Anne said, offering evening or afternoon instead of the morning, those are all possibilities on restructuring it. Uh, and I see we have more hands up. Mary Hefty. We are You're on muted, Mary. following the chat. And I think uh, what we have in front of us right now is a, is a nice forum of 40 people listening, uh, which is a great opportunity to get the enthusiasm and the interest in this into a committee. Uh, and that's pretty much what the, the chat is saying. Can we have a committee so that we actually understand what's at risk and what our benefits are and how we're taking our risk. And I just wonder whether uh, this meeting could be an opportunity to channel some of that enthusiasm to a larger uh, audience so that we could actually get more people involved in, in this decision making in a real way. Great comment. Um, I'm looking at the comments and Andy, you ask, no, we can charge. I, there, I, I heard some misspeak between in the earlier conversation about that. No, we can we can legally charge whatever we want. Uh, I think that that was just a misstatement uh, earlier that people are gonna have the option for free preschool or um, going to windmill or us. And another added factor into this is that Ladera is looking to reopen their preschool. So we're gonna have a third one uh, two. Um, so just a little clarification on that. Would love to form a committee. Um, let's see. Would Claire, would co incorporation mean more salaried people directing it or would it be as, as it is now with just the two people being the directors? It, it um, means that they would just have a separate legal entity and that they okay. would manage their own uh, results. In other words, if they, they would have to be figure out how to be profitable or sustainable on their own and that, that whether they are or aren't wouldn't fall on us. We would just have a clear relationship as a landlord tenant kind of relationship, which is how many, many uh, churches in the diocese operate. Well, can't that be figured out with the people we have now going on? Going on? Uh, it, it, if they if they wanted to do that, absolutely, I think that would be great. But they would need to do that. Can I can I respectfully ask that we move on from this? I have yeah. a meeting that I scheduled at noon, and I see that we're not even a third of the way through the agenda. So I don't know. Oh. Uh, I know this is important work, yeah. but I also think that uh, people are going to start to drop off, and we won't get to the rest of our annual meeting. Okay, that's a good thing. Um, was there anything that absolutely was not addressed that somebody wants to say? And Angela, you have your hand up. I will just say it is absolutely vital that we market now the preschool so that we know how many are coming and other preschools are marketing. And if we pulled back on our marketing now, that would be a very, very sad thing. Hey, Beth, one, one final thing. I do... I. I understand it, what everyone's saying. I did see the motion by Carl and Cherry uh, with one opinion on here. Um, one of the things I just want to point out or, or maybe ask you is what sort of flexibility do we have if three months down the road or before the next school year happens? If we do want to make an about turn, do we have flexibility in those contracts? We can. We that don't. might uh, buy us time. That's all yeah, I'm we don't um, recontract with teachers until May. And what about with students and parents? Like, um, we can write the 
the deposits, you know, such that there's a, you know, so that we're not legally obligated and leave a possibility open. So we could do that. If there's a- It might allow us time for a more robust discussion, Patricia. And, uh, you know- Okay. I move to form a committee right now or say that we're going to and uh, to discuss this and come back to the parish um, oh, right. and move on with the agenda. There's I'm already a motion that. on the table. Oh, okay. Well, then I'm seconding that motion. I re No, there's a different yeah. motion on no, the table. No, the motion I on the table is not to form a committee. And I think that we need to be really clear about that. And if you absolutely, if we're going to absolutely vote right now, I guess maybe we should see, but I have a feeling that we're, that is, it's not gonna pass. So I don't know why we're going through that um, uh, exercise. You know, I, I put those motions up there and uh, it was really draft thinking. I didn't really, I made a mistake in sending those, but uh, perhaps, perhaps it's a blessing in disguise. Uh, I, I would correct, correct what I say there in light of this great conversation that we've had. I, I think mm -hmm. what, I'm, I'm, what I'm hearing is that we have a lot of energy around uh, keeping some kind of effort focused towards children as part of the parish. And I'm hearing a lot of concern, not just by myself, but by others about the financial risk and implications. And I know that we have had, uh, not, not it hasn't been visible so much in this conversation, but I know that there have been conversations about uh, the extent to which the, 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 the preschool is, is part of the parish versus being a separate corporate entity of itself. And as Sherry mentioned, I didn't know that, that there, the schools that are successful in the diocese are uh, separate um, you know, corporations. And so I think Terry's question about the, your question, Terry, about the flexibility that we have around contracts with students, contracts with teachers. Uh, I didn't know both of those items. So in light of all of that, I think the spirit that I'm hearing of our group is yeah. that we want to have a deeper a conversation that's parish wide with more information sent out in advance, clarifying clarifying information that a lot of people are not aware of. I've been aware of this, uh, but I've also learned things from what Sherry has passed on and others have mentioned. So that's this. I think that's the spirit of the meeting, and I don't yeah. know that we need. I don't know that we need yes. a motion for. Yes. I don't know that we need a motion for that. But that is my read on the spirit of the meeting, and that we have the time and we have the energy and commitment to take that on. Well, yeah. I would also just add, and and Terry, what you just raised, and Beth, what you said, if there is flexibility, if there is an exit ramp for us as we sort this out then I'm fine with the process of yeah. having more full discernment. I mean, I would have liked to have more pre-work and advanced information so we could have been more prepared today. But since we aren't, as long as there's an exit ramp, I just, I would just, I think it would be a huge mistake to get locked into contracts that uh, bind us for another like 16 months. Uh, just, I do see a number of people asking me to withdraw my motion and I thought I effectively just did that. Okay. Apparently not. To make I'm just that, being official. To make yeah, that yeah. formal, uh, I withdraw both yeah. of my motions. Uh, okay. And, yeah. So let me just jump in here. We do not want to make any hasty decisions. And there, we do want to do this thoughtfully and intentionally in everything. And uh, this is probably uh, just a great segue to tell you that we want to hire a outside consultant because this is big and there are many things, many forks in our road and many things um, to discern, you know, with regard to uh, a rectory, with regard to affordable housing, with regard to perhaps restructuring the preschool or offering that. And that will require some deep listening and we could wait for two years to do that with, uh, you know, through this congregational vitality thing. Mm -hmm. But we have the means and the ability right now to, to bring in a consultant to help us do this very intentionally. And that's what the vestry is considering. So would love to have uh, people really help, Anne is our liaison with the 
with the preschool, but would really love to have her get some people from the church to support that and to come together and really look at that piece on of the preschool. I mean, that just thrills me to hear the interest and concern in that about that. So I think this is fabulous and it excites me that you all are, I, I see so much care about that. So we will have a, a special committee looking into that and we will start that in February and start the conversation and move to bring in this outside consultant. So quickly, we have 10 minutes and I know that Tricia was thinking that we uh, weren't very far through, but we're actually almost to the end. Um, yeah, so what we'd like to do right now is break into like four groups and, oh, Penny and Laird. I, I see oh. Penny and Laird have raised their hand. I, one thing I was going to say, Beth, but it's not that important, but I just think it's wonderful to have such a great open debate on it all because this is what the country needs more than anything right now. And, you know, there are a lot of intangible things and people with wonderful but very different ideas. And if you bring that, like you said, Beth, and like Carl said very well, and Ruthann and Sherry did, only with opposing uh, value, uh, you know, ways of looking at it, if you bring that all collectively together, there is a really good path forward. And it's just wonderful to have an open debate, which Absolutely. has been forgotten in the last two years sometimes in, in our country, you know. <laughs> so Thank you for that, Penny. Good. Yeah, so, yeah, that we love each other and that we have um, difficult conversations but hold each other in love and we all want what's best for our parish and for our children and we keep our eye on Christ and keep our eye on the prize. We're going to break out into, uh, we have um, Mary. Oh, sorry. We just have gotten a, a, a chat going of people who are interested in being on this committee. And we've got Great. I'm already gonna... three people. And so if anybody who's sort of really interested and excited about it, while you're doing all the rest of your stuff, put your name on the chat so that we can have more engagement. Because if we are hiring fancy consultants uh, there, it's only as good as, as those people who are participating. Yeah, great, thank you. So to this point, we're gonna break up into four groups and we have got some questions for you um, to really, uh, so Sherry's saying skip small groups and finish the report. I don't think that we have more to report. Oh, okay. Uh, Just a prayer on I mean, the uh, on the report uh, for the end. Yeah. Um, so, um, if people we, maybe we have the prayer and end the meeting, and if people want to continue in small groups, then they can. Yeah, Angela, so, can you capture the chat? I can save the chat as it is right now. Yes. Okay, just so you're capturing it, uh, because I can't find a pen. I, I, no, I will save the chat at the end of the Zoom, um, and, and so that'll have everybody's chat that is public to everyone. It won't have all the private chats. So if you I want can. to say something, say it to everyone, and then I can send it to um, Nicole and Beth. I but I do need to know whether to do breakout rooms or not. I cannot get into the public chat. I have been trying to put my name up to be on that committee as your new treasurer. Got you, got but, you. But I cannot get, I can only seem to respond to Diane Leonard and then I'm told I can't do that. Oh. So I don't know what happened, but anyway. Uh, I think choosing hey, the Betsy, chat. I, I just put your name into the chat. You have expressed interest. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Great. Great. Well, I, I'm excited that you guys are all willing to participate and do that. So should we, uh, what I really wanted to hear from everyone uh, in the small groups was 
what it was that brought you to Christ church. So that's what I wanted to know most importantly was what brought you to Christ church. So if you guys could all put that in the chat, that would be great. Maybe we could just say it in two words or three words going around the whole group and everybody just has three words to say what brought them to Christ church. That's a great idea. All right. Um, I'll go first. Uh, Sherry was already uh, a member of Christ Church, and uh, we started dating, and I uh, came to Christ Church. Uh, I had not had a church background. And at that time, Father John ran... Um, Three the, words! Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, well, you know, a sentence or two. Oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sher Sherry Lund, Father John Order Burns, and um, the Sunday evening um, uh, services. Okay. I um, got three words. I got three words. I got to do them first so somebody else doesn't take them. Faith, love, and charity. Oh, lovely. Um, I joined because, number one, my mother died, and I could stop having to take her every Sunday to Good Shepherd in Belmont. And second, um, I checked out St. Bede's and Christ Church and discovered all my former choir member friends from Holy Trinity we're now singing at Christ Church. So that was an easy join. So that's why I joined. Hi. <laughs> I'm Anne's Dan um, Vanderstay's daughter. Mom. mom. You're a mom. <laughs> I'm a mom. <laughs> I'm here um, because of family. Uh, I'm here because of the church. Family. And here, and frankly, Beth's message is really uh, true to my heart. So thank you. I'll go too. I'm here because I love Episcopal churches, and I looked at two. This one was closer, and I stuck with this one because of the preschool. Okay, I'll call out people's names. Maybe James. Yes, the Episcopal Church has been a part of my life ever since I was a little boy. More, more important than business or finance or other things at all, and it continues to be because of the people and the good that we're doing and the way we're working. Number one, number two, I definitely want to be involved in this discussion about the schools. Claiborne. Um, friends of ours in Ladera told us about Christ Church. Harold Broombaum was in pastor, and we started coming then. Ross and Mary. Oh. Our son was uh, an interim uh, music director, and we attended because of him. And we found everybody to be very uh, welcoming and supporting, and so we stayed. And he's in Oregon now. Hey, I what? With Angela. Hey, Angela. All right. <laughs> Wood. Okay, I'll give Wood time to unmute. Um, we've got Nicole there. I love you. Local Episcopal and John Oda Birds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll fill in Matthew's resume. Local. Uh, worship in community, um, meaningful community, and inspirational music. Kathy Kennedy. Oh, I think I know who it is. He joined because um, I was an Episcopalian and was looking for an Episcopal church, looked at two and loved this one. But we really got involved with the church when Mary, um, uh, or or Mary Fleischman organized um, ba a baby program uh, for parents. And um, and that's what drew us back into the church on a more regular basis. Bob Baruki. The family joined Christ Church when we moved here to Portola Valley in 1967. John Oda Burns was 1968. The... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Penny, Penny and Glad. Uh, 
I grew up in the Episcopal Church, and when after we'd had our family, Mary Fleischman was a very dear neighbor of ours, and she invited us to Christchurch. And I think our second or first first or second time going was John Odeburn's last day as a rector. And my children thought they literally died and I would say go to, gone to heaven because um, there was a mariachi band and they were like five and th two and they loved it. <laughs> and we Wendy McAdam. Well, I grew up going to Christ Church. So that's it was probably my parents' influence that brought me, but I have stayed because I love the, the community and the warm, friendly, non-judgmental vibe. Terry Lynn. <laughs> Terry's gone. Marcy. Marcy's gone. Okay, um, uh, sorry, I'm back. Um, Terry. Did you hear me? I was having trouble with the mute. Uh, so my three words, I'll be strict on this, are preschool, fellowship, and coffee. <laughs> Marcy. <laughs> Angela, are you going to do a word cloud for us? Oh, sorry. No, only if you typed all the words into, into the thing, but uh, I, I guess I could them. from the sound. I, I collected the words. I can do the words. La Lauren Wittin. Marcy. Uh, Sorry, well, I, I, I do very much enjoy this church, but I, I'm also an employee. <laughs> okay, Marcy. I just joined because it's such a wonderful community. I, I really love it up here. Okay, and I think that's everyone. Anybody else? Mary Payne. Oh, Mary, sorry, you're not in the same room as your husband. Sorry. Claiborne Jones. Wait, uh, I think something that's kind of important is one of the, we've been a lifelong Episcopalians and we love John Oderburns, but location had a lot to do with it. I mean, it's beautiful Portola Valley and it's right here. And that has a huge impact just being here. So we need to maintain our campus in our life. Thanks. Clay, Claiborne, did I miss you out? Yes. Yeah. No, no, I said. <laughs> I, thought, I, I thought you said oh, something. I missed that. Okay, anybody else? Thank you very much. What's next? Okay. Here's what's next is our prayer. Um, Hang on. God of our coming and going, God of our past, our present and our future, we have met, we have celebrated, we have remembered, we have visioned, shared hopes and dreamed dreams. And now we go into the world in which we do most of our living and our ministry. As we go out, remind us that we do not go alone. As we go out, remind us that we go with a mission. As we go out, fill us with love, hope, and peace to share with the world. May our lives and our ministry be signs of your love and promises and possibility for the world. Amen. <laughs> Trust me, we were going to finish by noon. Coffee hour. <laughs> Booyah. We Time for the coffee hour. You. I'm we hoping it will be a win win. 